Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile Fargo painter Karen Bakke and the week she spent at Fort Stevenson as she did an artist in resi residence there. But first joining me now is Ed Jonas, rancher in North Dakota. Ed, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. As we get started, before we get into uh, your company and your ranch, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe where you're originally from. Uh, originally outside of Cincinnati, country, mm -hmm. around cattle, yeah. horses. And how did you end up in North Dakota? Well, I uh, actually took a wrong turn, but uh, I ended up, uh, we lived in Montana, my wife and I, Connie, who owns the ranch with me. Uh, her daughters live in, in Walhalla, and uh, after going through a lot of difficulty in Montana with uh, wolves and forest fires and high cost and so forth, we decided to relocate our ranch here in 2015. All right, well, in fact, that's, you're here to talk more about that ranch, the Red River Valley Ranch Company. Uh, tell us about that and tell, yeah, that's explain the it to us. the name of our company, but we do business as Black Toe Mountain Ranch, which back in Montana, we were on the foot of the Black Toe Mountains. But since there aren't any mountains in North Dakota, we thought it more appropriate to adopt the name Red River Valley. Uh, we brought the company here to raise our Highmont cattle because of the pastures and the green grass and the nutrition that uh, fields have here. All right. With that said, uh, well, are, is it you and your wife, or do you have more? My, no, my wife, Connie, hands or? my wife Connie, and I, and some friends that help uh, lend a hand when we need to move the cattle and load them and uh, brand them and vaccinate them. Yeah. All right. Well, let, let's talk about uh, even though yeah people don't understand. Uh, Highmont beef. This is what you have. What is that? Highmont beef is a uh, name that I developed in 2006 and trademarked in Washington in 2007, which is a contraction between the two breeds that I developed. Uh, we uh, studied and researched the two lowest breeds for fat and cholesterol and found that the Scottish Highland and the Piedmontese from Italy were the two lowest breeds that uh, were known to man to be low in saturated fat and low in cholesterol. So I adopted the name and made it Highmont. We even trademarked it in 2007. Well, now you're doing this, but yet there are people that talk about prime beef. Well, we were talking before we got on. Uh, yeah. What, what about prime let, beef? Let me ask you a rhetorical question. If you had a, two burgers in a fry pan that were 80-20, that's 20% fat, and, and a pan full of sausage and a pan full of bacon would... After you take the meat out, would you pour that grease down your sink? And unanimously, well, nobody would. My plumber doesn't want me to, I know. <laughs> and your heart doctor doesn't want you to either. He does. Because even though some of that fat retains in the pan, there's some of the meat still has that fat. And, and the medical society has absolutely gone against meat, the meat industry and beef industry as being bad for your heart. So back in 2003, I decided that I was going to try to find an alternative. And that's how I researched this and found the Piedmontese in the Scottish Highland. But the Piedmontese, when I tried their beef independently, it was a little tender. It was very lean, but it didn't have a lot of flavor. Then in 2003 at the Denver Stock Show, I was invited to join some ranchers at their annual cattle dinner for the Scottish Highland Association. I uh, tried a piece of the beef and found the flavor outstanding, but it was tough. So I left that meeting and decided, I wonder what would happen if I crossed these two breeds for the first time and check with the, the heads of those associations, the Piedmontese Association and the Scottish Highland, and found that nobody had ever crossbred them. So I did it as an experiment. And by 05 and 06, we had our first calves. Uh, actually, 04, 05, by the time they went mm -hmm. to the processing plant, I then called uh, Warren Laboratories in Greeley, Colorado, and said, I want to do tests on this beef. They then asked me to combine 10 different cuts as a composite and send it to them. And when they got the results in April, of, uh, say March or April of 2006, it was remarkable how I could develop a third of the cholesterol and a fourth of the saturated fat in beef that the medical societies said you shouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so you've told us a little bit about the, the two uh, cows that you've bred together, but where, did you have to import them in, or where, yeah, where, where were they from? Uh, well, uh, the Scottish Highland came, came in from uh, York, Nebraska. A friend of mine, a doctor down there had some, 
and the Piedmontese, I brought some in from Canada, a couple, some breeding stock. Uh, but it was the, I also bought a bull, a feed bull from Twin Fall, the Twin Rivers, I think, uh, Montana. So we tried the combination of a, a, a Scottish Highland bull and a peed cows, and the Scottish Highland cows and a peed bull. And it worked out better with the Scottish Highland cows. Okay. So this wasn't an, I mean, an no, accident. No. You did this on purpose. You, you targeted this. I mean, you're in the Midwest region. How does this compare to bison meat? This is lower in fat and lower in cholesterol and tastes much better, and I'll tell you why. What I didn't tell you so far is that if you start with the genetics of these two breeds as, a, as the foundation of your herd, I then developed a new feed regimen. I had read in the 80s that oatmeal would reduce cholesterol for humans. And I thought, well, what if I gave it to the cows? What if I rolled the oats and gave it to cows and then mixed in some ground flaxseed and put some molasses in it? This oats, the oats that I have here, are the part of the feed regimen for all our cattle, especially our, the ones we feed out, that helps reduce the cholesterol to over a third of the normal cholesterol. So it, it's the feed regimen plus the genetics that makes this powerful in terms of being a heart healthy beef. Yeah, so, so you know, I started to say how to, but why did you try to come up with this method oh. of producing beef and lower and saturated Now that goes fat? back to my military career. Okay. I, I got hurt, I, I, I was at Rutgers University and had a deferment, but I decided to join the military in 1968 and in the fall of 67, went active in 68, came home hurt in the end of 68 um, from the military, from my actions in the military, and then spent a summer in the body cast in 1969 for spinal surgery. It was then that I decided that I was grateful that I survived uh, Vietnam, and I also d decided that I should take care of this body that God gave me. You know, I, it's something we need to appreciate that good health is a, is a treasure. So I began to look at labels. I began to look at what I was eating. Uh, almost, you know, uh, I'm a label reader, if you want to call it that. Uh, and then decided that that was the, the way I wanted to go. But my mother was Scottish, and we had a lot of beef, and it was consistently full of fat. And I would sit, cut the fat off. I think she thought I was going to be a brain surgeon. But I decided that I could do better. So in 01, 02, I finally had our place out in Montana. That's when I decided that if I'm going to develop something I want to eat, that's heart healthy for me and my family, then I've got to do something different because the, the beef industry uh, isn't quick to change. Uh, and even in the face of the fact that the medical societies tell, tell everybody not to eat it, they're not changing. But I became a maverick in the industry. Uh, and there were ranchers that's, uh, you know, that laughed at what I was doing. But now we've been in business 16 to 17 years and we're in health food stores, we're at Prairie Roots Food Co-op, right down the street, uh, NP Avenue. Uh, we're in the Bisman Food Co-op in Bismarck, and we're natural grocers, and we uh, ship beef all over the United States. So people want this, and the question is, how do we get the message to them that it's available? Now you say all over the United States. Is it more specialty uh, type? Uh... Well, we have a website, okay. and people will order on the website. And we started. We were actually. Uh, lucky enough to be featured in Sunset Magazine and the Denver Post and Men's Health Stories and, and, and a lot of uh, publicity, which spread the word uh, throughout the United States. We literally ship from probably Alaska to Arizona to Florida to Vermont. Well, this leads up to my next question. So, so in those uh, 15, 16, whatever years, you know, what have been the results so far on the market for you? It's been very successful. Uh, it's harder to find the land to be able to expand, but we, we had a recession in 08, and the 08 recession had an impact on a lot of things. People would call us and say, we love your meat, but we just lost our job, so we don't have the money to do it. So we kind of waded through it and uh, started building up our herd again, and now we're prepared to go, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we are national, but we, we just need to get the message to people that there is an alternative. You know, if you ask me, what makes me want to do this? It's because I love life, you know, and I, my philosophy is, is if you love life and you love your family, you love your children, you want them to eat well, you want to be around for them so that you can be a grandpa one day or a grandma. 
Uh, so this is all a question of choices. And when people make the right choices and they eat well, it's because they're happy and they're gen genuinely concerned about the people they love. Yeah. What kind of, of proteins will people get from eating your beef? Well, the proteins are listed on our website and the nutrition facts, which is really basically what we copied. I could read it from well, you uh, don't have flyers, to but okay. it's high protein, mm -hmm. but it's the saturated fat that we wanted to try to drive down and the cholesterol. Uh, my wife's entire family have had cholesterol issues through the years, and her cholesterol, my wife's cholesterol, Connie, who is, without her, I couldn't do this, has got the lowest in their entire family. Mm -hmm. So. It's, uh, it's something that we try to design uh, to change people's lives and save lives. Well, now, you mentioned about the taste, and, you know, have you had any pushback uh, from people now uh, well, on, on the, that just doesn't taste as good? If you're looking for a taste of fat, we're not it. And if some people think that the flavor comes from the fat, well, it doesn't. That's just a misnomer. That, that leads me to the misconception of Prime, that uh, there's a book that I brought today on food and cooking by Harold McGee. I have the fourth edition. And in the book, it talks about the propaganda industry, the cattle industry back in uh, about 1921-22, started to advertising that prime beef with all the fat gave it great flavor and great taste. Well, the USDA did a study in 1927 that dispelled that rumor. It wasn't true. But yet today, we have people who think that if it doesn't have fat, it can't taste good, but it does depend on the genetics of the animal, and also depends on what you feed it. Mm. And, and in terms of pushback, I think I've had one complaint in 14 years from somebody who put it on too high heat. Now, one of the things you gotta remember about our beef, it has little or no fat in it. I brought some photos uh, and, uh, to offer you to show you how little fat this beef has. Uh, if you're looking for the flavor from fat, that's not it. But the manner in which you cook the beef, and uh, Harold McGee talks about it in his book. The, uh, the, it's a chemical reaction. The higher the heat, the more it affects the taste of the beef and the, st the strength. So the, we cook our beef on low heat, uh, a burger at 250 to 275, and we keep the heat under 300 degrees on it. If you cook it low and slow, it's very tender and very flavorful. But like anything, the, uh, the chemical reaction when you turn up the heat changes the uh, taste of the beef. And so our beef is not one you want to put on the, on the grill on high heat. Hmm. Well, you hear that for bison meat, low and slow. You hear that for barbecue, you know, low and slow. Uh, so maybe, yeah, you've got something there. But what about any pushback about just meat in general is not good for you, well, especially too much meat? I hear that, uh, but I'll tell you this. When I tried to call Harvard Medical School for medical research, to leave a message, to, dis to start a dialogue that there's an alternative to what they've been studying, I don't hear from them. When I call the American Heart Association to tell them there is an alternative, I don't hear from them. So the question is, is uh, the pushback is from people that don't know this exists, but once they know it exists, it's been very popular. Uh, people who really care about living uh, have no hesitation to buy this beef, and uh, we're happy to do it, because I think Part of my objective was to basically save lives. I've lost some friends who dropped dead at 56 with heart attacks, and you hear about it all the time. Something that can be prevented, we can change. But they have to, they have to eat it. They have to uh, care about their health. Yeah, so, something I may have skipped over and just want to clarify, uh, your meat is USDA approved? Yeah. And, well, okay. it's, when you say approved, it's USDA, USDA inspected. inspected. I, I get my beef cut. Uh, in Miles City, Montana, which is a, a great USDA plant, very professional, and they package it, they vacuum pack it, and they seal it. But it's all USDA approved. You know, so how did you go about uh, doing your lab test results to get, get all this? Well, I mentioned to you before, I yeah. sent the composites, 10 different cuts to uh, Greeley, Colorado, to Warren Laboratories, and they were the ones that generated that report, which is incorporates, uh, it's not only on our website, but it's in our brochures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so uh, have you had any trouble getting the word out? I mean, with this day and age, with technology, but still, it's a it's a different kind of beef. Uh, so, have you had difficulties? Uh, the word is low and slow. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've, it's been in newspapers and magazines. I've had this beef in New York City, uh, so but. 
people aren't quick to change, especially with the propaganda from the 1920s that everybody thinks if it's not a prime steak, it can't be good. So we have to re-educate the, the, the public. And once the public knows about this, they study it. I studied this. You know, I was uh, in the service. I was an analyst, intelligence analyst. I examined all these details, and I said, this makes sense. So we have to let the public know that it exists. Um, we uh, do little or no marketing. We have had some publicity. We've been lucky about that. But, uh, uh, you know, we've been able to accomplish this in large part because the product sells itself. Once people realize that it's heart healthy and they understand the connection between high fat and heart disease, it really sells itself. Well, I would assume that the beef industry is a pretty powerful industry. And has there been any pushback there? And well, maybe that they don't really want alternative uh, beef. Well, listen, there are some fast food places selling impossible beef. I'd like to know what's in it. You know, most people don't question. And I, like I said, I was a label reader after I got hurt. I said, what's in this? You know, what, what do they put in this burger that's supposed to taste like meat but is not? You know, people just take things on blind faith sometimes and assume that the government's going to protect them. Uh, my mother had that, uh, that opinion, but it didn't. Uh, in fact, it goes back to when I was going to school. And I told her I needed to study, and she said, well, have some coffee. I said, I don't like the taste. She said, well, have this cream or coffee mate. So I picked up the, the bottle and read it. I said, Mom, this isn't milk. This is a chemistry lab. I can't even pronounce some of these names. But she said, this is important. The government wouldn't let them produce it if it wasn't okay for you. Well, that's not true now, is it? Mm -hmm. So you got to do your own thinking. And that's what I expect people who want to buy our beef to be thinkers and care about their health and care about living. Well, it, there's a school of thought uh, through research that cholesterol actually isn't, uh, you know, bad for you or, you know, at least in certain ranges, you know, can you talk more about your thoughts? You've, you've talked about your wife's cholesterol. Uh, well, that's a medical opinion. Uh, we get one about once a week most of the time. We get opinions about just about everything. Uh, the question is, is uh, I think a normal range of cholesterol is under 200. Uh, so and mine's about 140. Uh, and my wife's about 212, I think it is. But she's uh, very healthy. We're very healthy. Um, so I don't really have an opinion. I think I'd really defer to a, you know, a scientist to be able to make that opinion. But the saturated fat, the fat that goes into your system, uh, there's a generation that thinks we'll just buy a stent. We'll get a few stents instead of taking care of our health and watching what we eat. And that's, that's the mentality of who I have to try to educate, that you do have some responsibility to take care of your own health. Yeah. So where does your business go from here? Well, I'm hoping that I'll find a young rancher that's got some energy with a, a family that wants to help me develop this. You know, I'm 71 years old, and uh, my wife wants me to take a vacation. And you don't get many vacations because my cattle like to eat seven days a week. And trying to find help up in Walhalla has been kind of difficult. Uh, there are a lot of farmers, but there aren't many cowboys and ranchers that, that I can ask to help. So. That's the only only problem. But my wife wants me to take time off. I'd like to see if somebody would like to jump in and uh, promote this because I think we could do something good for society. Well, we're out of time, but if people want more information, where, where can they go? Who can they contact? Our website, well, first of all, you can go to Prairie Roots Food Co-op. They have a whole line of our beef. Mm -hmm. Natural Grocers in Grand Forks, Natural Grocers here in Fargo. The website, and by the way, in that Bismarck Food Co-op in Bismarck, but. Our website is www.blacktailmountainranch.com. All right. Well, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Thanks for joining hey, us today. Th thank you, John. Appreciate it. Stay tuned for more. Karen Bakke is a top-selling painter who lives in Fargo, and her art is very diverse as she specializes in portraits, murals, sketches, and everyday life. This summer, Karen was the featured artist in residence at Fort Stevenson State Park near Garrison, North Dakota, where she spent a wonderful week working on her art. I took art as a sloth class, 
something easy and that was when I was 13 and who knew that that was my career. My name is Karen Bakke. I am an artist, fine artist, mural artist. I've been doing it for 42 years professionally. I sold paintings or drawings at the age of seven because my dad bought them. <laughs> I wanted to go to the candy store and, Dad, I have a painting. And so he would buy my drawings for a nickel and a quarter and a dime. This needs to be cooler, so I put a little blue in this line here. I pretty much paint everything because I like to eat. This is my sole income, <laughs> and it always has been. I just think it's good to grow and paint everything because every time you do something different, you're going to learn. I really enjoy painting animals. I did portraits for a while because if you can do a portrait well, you can do a landscape then. My painting actually mirrors my life. Typically my palettes are colorful and my art sometimes it's impressionistic but much more realistic and that's what I am. The North Dakota Council on the Arts gives our department funding to host these artists. And it's essentially putting these artists to work. We provide lodging and we provide promotions of their artwork and their events. And they're being supported by getting people to come in and see what they do and to be able to give them a venue to share that. And I think that's pretty amazing. As the parks, what we get out of it is we get potential new user groups, we get people to our parks, and we get some beautiful artwork because as part of the program, the artists donate a piece of their work that reflects their residency. It's really a nice opportunity for both the parks and the artists just to come to the park with nothing else to do but paint, no other obligations. I really enjoy coming by myself because there's so much solitude. I can put all of my thoughts into that painting. I will do a one hour presentation and just tell them about my work and what I've been doing here and how I portrayed the state park. Because we want to promote not only art, but you want to promote the state and its parks and let people know it's really nice out here. People have different ways they connect with the outdoors, art being one of them. This is yet another attraction that we can have at our state parks that attract a different user group to our state parks. That's pretty awesome. It is nice to have a photo, but the plein air painting or the painting outdoor from life, it's top-notch training. It's like hitting the elliptical as hard as you can go. It really taxes your brain, so about two hours and mentally I'm just wiped. I am hoping that through my art and some of the paintings that maybe someone will think twice about walking down a path because I try to find things that people pass by. Rain or shine, I'm out there in the mist and the rain getting what I can. Karen's work is amazing. I'll be the first one to tell you that I am not an artist. I don't speak their lingo but I have a true appreciation for it. I look at Karen's work and Karen celebrates life, life in the form of plants or animals, and she's able to bring a ceiling to life through a mural, a wall to life, and that just amazes me. Karen's worked with us a few times and she's amazing with the public, all ages. Okay, so I'm gonna give you watercolor paper. Um, oh, I guess you need paint. Okay, how you doing? Oh, that's much better. When I took art in high school, it was take a picture and copy the picture. and. That's two-dimensional, and 
when you're looking at the real person or the real animal, it's three dimensions and you see so much more. I'm all about growing, getting better, learning something new, get out of your comfort zone. So a lot of times I'm saying, yikes. <laughs> I kind of have an attitude where I'm not going to give up and I'm going to go after it. So I fail a lot, but I'm going to mess up until I don't mess up. <laughs> I'm going to fail until I don't fail. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.